Hi, everybody. Good morning, and um, I'm pleased to be with you to talk to you a little bit about uh, civil commitment and how we came to be uh, where we are uh, today. Let me uh, share my slides here with you, and we'll dive right in, and I'm looking forward to your comments and, and questions uh, afterwards. Um, Okay. So what I want to do uh, over the next uh, half hour uh, is to uh, review with you the history uh, of the law of civil commitment in this country. And uh, the reason for doing that is, is not mere antiquarianism. Uh, it is uh, because I, it's my view that in order to understand civil commitment law today, one has to understand the history of it. Uh, in, in essence, civil commitment uh, law today resembles an archaeological site. Uh, there are many layers of law that have gone into it over the last century and a half, uh, and they were all put there for uh, a, a reason. Uh, and uh, understanding that reason, uh, I think, is essential to understanding how the law uh, works and, and uh, the ways in which sometimes the law uh, doesn't work. We also want to uh, talk with you a little bit about the effects of the most recent round of statutory reform that we've been through in this country. And then to the extent that we have time, uh, I will talk a little bit about uh, the, the major innovation in civil commitment law uh, over the last several decades, which is the move towards outpatient commitment uh, and uh, both uh, what that hopes uh, to achieve and, and what its limitations uh, have been. So uh, just to give you a, a preview, uh, I'm going to divide the historical uh, period into uh, five uh, epochs, if you will, uh, beginning with colonial times to the 1830s, what I call the pre-institutional period, of the 1830s to the end of the Civil War, the early institutional uh, period, uh, end of the Civil War to the Gilded Era, uh, Gilded Era to the mid-20th century, uh, the uh, period in the uh, late mid-20th century uh, when we had uh, our most recent uh, time of uh, intensive uh, statutory uh, reform and litigation, uh, and then you'll see how we ended up where we are uh, today. So to begin uh, where this uh, country uh, began uh, in uh, colonial uh, times, uh, in the times of the colonies, uh, there were, of course, no institutions, uh, no hospitals. Uh, at the very beginning, not even jails or uh, poorhouses uh, at first. Uh, where uh, people with mental illness could be uh, relegated or uh, cared for. Uh, the mentally ill in the early uh, colonial period were simply ignored uh, or uh, in uh, some places uh, dealt with under the criminal laws and as they developed uh, later on, the poor laws, uh, which is to say they were arrested for vagrancy, uh, begging um, minor uh, disturbances of the peace uh, and uh, jailed for short periods of time once jails uh, were established. Uh, the, New, the New England colonies had a, an interesting system uh, which they called warning out. Uh, that is, uh, it was a mechanism for getting rid of outsiders who might appear in uh, their town uh, and who were considered undesirable uh, to be there, uh, they would be marched to the border of the town and warned out, that is told never to come back. Uh, and then they'd be in the next towns and town and they would be that town's responsibility uh, and um, perhaps would undergo the same warning out process there. And, and then again and again, it, it's a, a, a ship of fools kind of uh, story wandering from port to port. Uh, 
uh, and never being able to uh, establish uh, a secure residence uh, anywhere. Uh, as jails and almshouses were built, as the colonies uh, matured, uh, they began to fill with people with mental illnesses. There was nowhere else for them to go. There were no other institutions dedicated to their uh, care. Uh, the earliest uh, hospital uh, in the colonies uh, is not established until 1751, so it's almost a century and a half uh, after the first uh, colonial uh, settlement in, in uh, Virginia. Uh, we see the first hospital established, that's in Philadelphia, uh, the Pennsylvania Hospital, which exists until this day, uh, and the second patient admitted to the Pennsylvania Hospital in 1752 was, in fact, a, a person with uh, mental illness. Uh, when the successors to the Pennsylvania Hospital in Massachusetts and New York uh, and other colonies uh, began to uh, develop in the early states, uh, they were dealt with uh, in the same way all other patients were dealt with, which is to say, uh, as far as the early hospitals uh, were concerned, uh, there uh, was really no such thing as uh, a voluntary uh, hospitalization. Patients were generally not brought to a hospital for any purpose unless they were quite severely ill, uh, and they were usually brought by their family. Uh, the family would approach the hospital, ask for admission, uh, if needed, uh, pay in advance for a, a particular period of uh, care. Uh, and when the money ran out or the patient was ready to leave, uh, the patient would be discharged. So the patient was, was not terribly active in this process. It was negotiated around the patient, uh, typically by their uh, family members. There were no statutes that governed uh, the uh, hospitalization of people with mental illness or any other patients for that matter. Uh, states were not uh, involved uh, at all as we moved uh, from the colonial period through the revolution uh, and into the early years of this uh, country. And until the 1830s, which is to say for more than 200 years uh, after this nation was founded, uh, that was the system of caring for people with mental illness. They could be jailed. They might be put in almshouses uh, where they were supported, uh, but often uh, required uh, to work for their uh, room and board. Uh, they might be hospitalized in one of the few hospitals that uh, existed, uh, but all this went on outside uh, of any legal uh, process. Things begin to change uh, in the uh, 1830s, uh, and uh, the drivers of that change uh, are a group of reformers uh, in New England, the most prominent of, of whom was a, a woman named Dorothea Dix, a school teacher, Sunday school teacher, uh, who uh, began visiting uh, inmates in the local jail. She lived in Cambridge. She went to the Middlesex County Jail. Uh, and uh, was uh, there to, to teach them uh, about uh, religion, uh, but uh, she was stunned to see how many of them uh, were there essentially because they were mentally ill. And she wondered if the Middlesex County Jail was unusual in some way, and so she started visiting other jails in the state uh, and almshouses in the state, uh, and found that a huge proportion of inmates of both uh, were people with uh, mental illness. Uh, she then gathered around her uh, a group of reformers who were interested in addressing uh, this issue. They had the strong belief that jails and almshouses were not the right place for people with uh, mental illness. Uh, and uh, they petitioned the legislature uh, to build a state asylum, as they were called back then, uh, the first hospital uh, in the state uh, specifically for the treatment of people with uh, mental illness. Now, it wasn't the first 
designated psychiatric hospital in this country. Uh, that hospital uh, was built in Virginia, in fact, in Williamsburg, Virginia, uh, what later became Eastern State Hospital. Uh, and uh, if you go to the Williamsburg uh, recreation uh, today, uh, you will see a recreation of that original building with some exhibits uh, dedicated to the early treatment of uh, people with uh, mental illness. Uh, but in 1833, uh, Worcester State Hospital uh, opens in Massachusetts, and it becomes the model uh, for state hospitals for many years uh, to come. Uh, this was an era of what has been called therapeutic optimism uh, and moral care. That is, these reformers believed not just that they could provide a more humane environment if they took people with mental illness out of jails and almshouses, but that they could actually provide a more therapeutic environment, that taking them out to the country, which is where these hospitals were generally uh, built, uh, and uh, treating them in a way that gave them uh, some self-confidence, uh, allowing them to work. The men worked on the farms that surrounded the hospitals. The women did sewing and embroidering and, and other kinds of, of interior tasks, uh, that that would uh, lead them to reconstitute themselves and be able to be uh, discharged, uh, cured. Uh, and the first commitment statutes are enacted in this era beginning in the 1830s and continuing in the 1840s and 50s, and they essentially codify the existing practices, which is to say that they um, embody the notion that either family members or for indigents, overseers of the poor, uh, would bring the patient to the hospital, uh, that the physician in charge or his designee uh, would determine that it was appropriate for the person to be uh, hospitalized, uh, and they would be hospitalized and kept as long as uh, that was necessary. Um, but the patient played no role in that uh, process. Um, moreover, uh, the signature of the admitting physician was adequate legal warrant uh, for their uh, confinement, uh, the courts were not initially involved uh, at all. That set of procedures essentially continues uh, until uh, after the Civil War, uh, which uh, marks the start of a period of increasing dissatisfaction with uh, the state hospitals. Uh, the dissatisfaction comes from the fact that they were beginning to fill up with uh, more patients than had been envisioned uh, initially. Uh, and legislatures uh, were beginning to balk at providing adequate resources, adequate funding uh, for a continued high level of moral treatment. Uh, they begin to feel a little bit more like warehouses uh, than they do like uh, facilities for active uh, therapy and the quality of care and the quality of life uh, declines. And for the first time, we begin to see complaints about the abuse of the commitment process. The most famous uh, of these comes from a, a, a woman uh, in uh, Illinois, the wife of a uh, preacher, Elizabeth Packard, uh, who uh, was committed involuntarily by her husband, alleged that she was railroaded just to get her out of the way, because she was inconvenient uh, to him. Uh, and after her release, uh, travels the country, writes a number of books about her experiences, uh, and urges uh, the first of the legal reforms uh, of the commitment process. Uh, and uh, her uh, favored legal reform uh, was a requirement for a jury trial. Uh, that is, uh, she argued that before anybody was involuntarily committed, they should have a chance before a jury of their peers uh, to establish that they actually did not need to be uh, in the hospital. Uh, along with uh, jury trial, uh, other reforms that are adopted in that period include a requirement for judicial review at some point early on uh, in the commitment process, uh, free communication with counsel and with, with political leaders uh, and uh, others. Uh, 
another innovation of the period uh, is the uh, initiation of uh, the uh, uh, process of voluntary uh, admission. So for the first time in 1881, a state, Massachusetts was in the lead again, uh, adopted uh, a statutory provision uh, that allowed patients to sign themselves into the hospital uh, and to sign themselves uh, out of the hospital, a true voluntary uh, admission process. New York followed in 1882, and the idea uh, caught on, although from that point through the 1960s, uh, only a minority uh, of patients who were in the hospitals uh, were there voluntarily. The vast majority were still uh, involuntarily committed. What's important to recognize in this first era of procedural reform uh, is that as the procedures were being changed, the substantive criteria for involuntary commitment remained the same. And, and they were essentially that a person uh, was mentally ill and in need of hospitalization or in need of care and treatment in a hospital. The language varied uh, a bit from state to state, uh, but the basic idea did not. Somebody judged that they were mentally ill and they needed to be hospitalized, and that was all uh, that needed to be uh, proven. From the 1890s uh, into uh, uh, the mid uh, 20th century, uh, we saw a, an alternating uh, series of uh, reform cycles, uh, which were driven by two conflicting sets of desiderata. Uh, when among the public, concern about access to treatment predominates, that is when it was believed that it was just too hard to get people into a hospital, procedures were relaxed. Uh, and uh, one example of that comes in the progressive era in the first decade of the 20th century, when we see the introduction for the first time of uh, what we know today as two physician certificates. That is, uh, physicians were allowed without judicial review, at least without prospective judicial review, uh, to sign a form that authorized the involuntary hospitalization of somebody who was mentally ill, and thought to be in need of uh, hospitalization. But when concern about the rights of patients uh, is foremost in the public's mind, when they're worried about exposés uh, suggesting that patients are being uh, railroaded uh, into the uh, hospitals, we see a tightening of procedures. For example, a requirement for judicial review of so-called warrants of apprehension before uh, someone can go out and bring a patient in, it wasn't enough to have two physicians' signatures. Uh, a judge had to approve the process. And, and these considerations are in tension, uh, both reflecting legitimate public concerns, but, but in opposite uh, directions. Again, however, and then this is, is critical to keep in mind, the substantive criteria were unchanged. We're still talking about criteria that focus on need for care and uh, treatment. The 1960s and the 1970s uh, are the period during which our current system comes into place. So we are dealing with a system that, that is um, at minimum 50 years old, half a century old now, and has gone undergone relatively little change uh, over the last half century. And, and in order to understand how we got the system we have uh, right now, one has to recall uh, what the 1960s and 1970s uh, were like. Uh, it was a period when civil liberties uh, had a new focus, were a new focus of uh, public attention, the civil rights revolution that begins with Brown versus Board of Education uh, in 1954, uh, gives the courts new tools for protecting uh, the rights of minority groups, which eventually uh, come to include uh, people with mental illnesses uh, against the state. 
It was also a period when the legitimacy of institutions, all institutions, uh, was uh, being uh, questioned, uh, and that included psychiatric uh, institutions. Uh, and the questioning didn't just come from former patients or critics of psychiatry. It came from within the profession uh, as well uh, as community uh, psychiatrists uh, who had um, uh, coalesced around a, a group of ideas that were first formulated during World War II in the Army Medical Corps uh, and then brought home uh, after uh, the war. Uh, argued that large state institutions where people were committed for long periods of time were actually detrimental. They led to institutionalization uh, and uh, a loss of functional capacities of patients. And that what we ought to have instead was a system of smaller community-based facilities, both inpatient but especially outpatient, uh, where people could be treated uh, rapidly in close contact with their home communities and families uh, and uh, return to the community as quickly as uh, possible. Uh, it was a period of general suspicion of the state and expertise in, in general. Uh, this was when Thomas Zoss published his uh, famous uh, Myth of Mental Illness, a book whose uh, title uh, was probably as uh, influential uh, as anything that was uh, in the book. Uh, and uh, it, 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 uh, it was a period in which the reality of mental illness itself uh, was uh, being uh, questioned. Uh, those questions uh, were of intense interest uh, to uh, legislators uh, who, uh, were concerned about what the mental health system was uh, costing uh, the state budget. Uh, the mental health budget was the Medicaid budget of its day, by which I mean, in most states, the largest single expenditure uh, in the state budget was for the support of the state psychiatric hospitals. Uh, and it just kept going up every year. And legislators were desperate to get a handle on that and to find a way uh, of reducing uh, the cost. Put all that together uh, and uh, uh, add uh, to that uh, the legal challenges that were uh, brought uh, against the existing generation of uh, commitment uh, laws. Uh, and uh, you end up with fertile ground for a revolution. And the revolution initially uh, was driven by the courts. Uh, as exemplified by Lassard v. Schmidt, a Wisconsin uh, federal district court case in 1971, uh, the courts, uh, emboldened by the new powers that they had been given by the, the uh, Supreme Court led by Earl Warren, uh, began to strike down existing commitment statutes uh, on two grounds. Uh, first, that they were overbroad, which is to say that by allowing anybody who was in need of treatment to be involuntarily hospitalized, they exceeded the legitimate bounds of state power, that the state had no right and no interest uh, to confine people merely for their own good, uh, that there had to be something more. Uh, and uh, what that had to be uh, was a danger uh, to the public at large or conceivably to the person themselves. Uh, the statutes were also struck down as unduly vague. It was argued that need for uh, care and treatment in a hospital uh, was a standard that amounted to whatever a psychiatrist uh, said it was. Uh, and therefore was uh, not easily susceptible to review uh, by the uh, courts uh, and hence was constitutionally deficient uh, as well. Moreover, uh, in addition to challenging the substantive standard for the first time, uh, these cases challenged the adequacy of the procedures that attended involuntary uh, hospitalization, uh, especially to the extent that they deviated from the criminal procedural model. Uh, and so the courts, 
and Lessard again is a good example here, began to require a, a list of uh, rights uh, for uh, patients who were people who were being subject to involuntary hospitalization, rights to notice, uh, a right to be present at their hearing, a right to have an attorney represent them, a right to the rules of evidence being applied, including limitations on hearsay evidence, a right to appeal initial determinations, and a right to periodic review. So no longer could people be found to need hospitalization and then uh, retained indefinitely uh, without ever having a chance to contest that hospitalization in a, in a court. Um, as we said, uh, the need for treatment standard, the historic standard, was replaced by the dangerousness criteria that I think you all know very well. Uh, the most, um, uh, the, the strictest, most extreme, if, if you will, uh, version of that appeared in the decision in Lassard, which required prior to uh, authorization of involuntary hospitalization, that there be an extreme likelihood that if the person is not confined, he will do immediate harm to himself or others. Dangerousness is, which is to say must be, based upon a finding of a recent overt act, attempt, or threat to do substantial harm to oneself or another. So note the language, an extreme likelihood of immediate harm uh, as manifested by a recent overt act, attempt, or threat to do substantial harm uh, to oneself uh, or uh, another. Um, so you can see from a, a fairly loosely structured system with fairly vague criteria, uh, we, we shifted to a, a much more stringent set of criteria and one that very different from its antecedent focused on dangerousness as opposed to uh, need for uh, treatment. Um, a criminalized model of procedures uh, was uh, adopted and, and um, for reasons of time, I won't go uh, into, uh, into those. But I do wanna say something about what the consequences uh, of these reforms uh, uh, were. These are reforms with which we live today, as any of you who are familiar with existing statutes are uh, well aware. Uh, the goal, the explicit goal of the reformers uh, was to limit the power of the state uh, and to reduce the number of people who were being involuntarily committed. Civil libertarians thought that that was um, going to increase the, the rights of a, of a group that was being treated as a, uh, uh, a disenfranchised minority. Uh, legislators, legislators believe that uh, it would reduce the expenditures for uh, mental health care in the state uh, budget. Uh, community psychiatrists thought there'd be a more effective system of care that would be developed in the community as opposed uh, to the hospital. If you look at the uh, empirical literature uh, that uh, attempts to uh, elucidate what the consequences of the reforms uh, were, uh, what you see is much less impact of these reforms than uh, expected. Uh, there were decreases in uh, the number of people who were committed, uh, but those decreases seem to relate more to the concomitant process of deinstitutionalization, which was closing down state hospital beds. There was just nowhere to put these people, and so uh, commitments just didn't take place. Uh, moreover, studies that attempted to identify patients who were really in need of being hospitalized, uh, but were not hospitalized because of the new stringent criteria, uh, found that it was very difficult to identify such people, that most patients who really needed treatment uh, were involuntarily hospitalized if they weren't willing to come in uh, voluntarily. But there were, of course, large variations across uh, jurisdictions that we can certainly uh, talk about. However, there is a general perception that the laws made involuntary commitment uh, more difficult to uh, affect. Um, what the laws did not particularly do, what, what the dangerousness-based approach does not particularly uh, do, uh, is resolve the ambiguity one might say vagueness uh, of uh, the statutory uh, criteria. Uh, 
uh, Alexander Brooks, one of the legal pioneers in this area, uh, uh, noted that dangerousness essentially had four components, the magnitude of the harm, the probability it would occur, how frequently it was likely to occur, and how imminent it, it was, uh, and that sometimes these had to be traded off against each other. Um, but in order to assess uh, any of these uh, four, much less to balance them uh, against each other, um, the um, process resembled art more than it did science. We were still in the realm uh, of having to make uh, difficult judgments that were not easily susceptible uh, to, uh, to review. Uh, and that's where we are today. Uh, we have a, a very different system, but one that is uh, clearly aimed at um, uh, at uh, uh, focusing on uh, dangerousness, um, but but no easier to uh, implement than than the old uh, system uh, was. Um, I think I don't have time right now to get into outpatient uh, commitment, although I'm happy to answer uh, questions about that. Uh, but but let me uh, uh, wrap up. Um, uh, to summarize, there's been a marked shift uh, in legal rules over the last uh, 50 years. We've moved to dangerousness style uh, criteria and criminal style uh, procedures. Uh, we have in some states adopted outpatient commitment as an alternative. Uh, and uh, we've implemented more restrictive rules on involuntary treatment, which we can also talk about that, if you like, uh, even of committed uh, patients. Um, where we are today represents a compromise between two important concerns, as commitment law always has, between, on the one hand, a paternalistic desire to help people who are having a hard time uh, in their lives, maybe in a great deal of distress and pain, uh, and on the other hand, to respect their autonomous decisions, especially if they're deemed competent to make those decisions uh, about whether or not they want to be uh, treated. Um, we may not agree uh, among us uh, as to whether the line today has been drawn in the right place, uh, but we do need to recognize that there are important values on both sides of this uh, debate. Uh, and any future reform uh, is going to have to balance these set these, this set of conflicting uh, considerations, uh, although it may not necessarily uh, balance them in, in the same way the current system uh, does. So let me uh, stop there. Let me stop sharing my screen, and I think we can move uh, to your questions and uh, comments.
Thanks, Dr. Applebaum. That's a wonderful presentation, really comprehensive, and I appreciate your precise language. Thank you. We have a bunch of questions from uh, that we got via email and in the chat, uh, and we'll just proceed as we receive them. Uh, the first one is, um, were, there, were there civil commitment laws in other countries that helped shape law in the US? So um, in the 19th century, um, most of the, um, uh, of the world had not yet developed uh, commitment law in a formal statutory sense. Uh, and we were not, uh, as a country, looking abroad for guidance. That we, we were very much interdirected in terms of the development of our uh, commitment laws. I will say that our reforms of the 1970s and from the start of the 1970s to the end of that decade, every state in this country changed its uh, commitment uh, law. Um, the, um, the pattern set by the United States has been very influential in other countries uh, abroad. Uh, there are still countries that retain something like, like Britain that retain something more like a need for care and treatment uh, standard, uh, but most of continental Europe and, and much of the rest of the world uh, has moved to a dangerousness-based standard uh, today as well. Hmm. Fascinating. Um, we have a question about, Do you, it seems like every state's law is different. Uh, we're out here in Oregon and ours don't work. Do you have any opinion about state laws, state by state? Which ones are better? Which ones are worse? Uh, so uh, let, let me answer that in, in, a, in a general uh, way, uh, which is to say that um, when people are in uh, a, uh, a, a mental health crisis, um, the, um, the circumstances uh, of their situations are, are so different one from another and, and so unique one from another. Uh, that statutes that try to embody an approach like the one in Lassard uh, with, with very strict, specific criteria uh, run the risk of um, excluding uh, people who really need help uh, from being helped uh, during those uh, crises. Uh, a certain degree of flexibility in the criteria uh, I think is um, very important uh, in allowing these statutes to do what they're supposed to do, uh, which is to identify people who may hurt themselves or hurt other people uh, and very much need uh, hospitalization. So uh, that's one way I, I would answer the, uh, the uh, question. As far as procedures are concerned, uh, although uh, procedures are um, more alike than uh, uh, unlike each other from state to state, uh, there are some interesting uh, uh, differences. So in New York, for example, New York is the only state in which a court hearing uh, does not uh, take place as a matter of course after involuntary commitment. Uh, in fact, hearings are uncommon. Uh, hmm. Instead, every patient who's involuntarily committed uh, is uh, assigned an attorney uh, at public expense who comes to meet with the person and tell them that they have a right to a hearing if they desire it. Uh, but most patients don't desire it. Most patients waive that right, uh, believing that you know, maybe they don't want to be there, but they probably do need to be there and they're not likely to win a hearing anyway. And um, they can always have a hearing if, if, they, uh, if they desire it. Uh, and the courts have upheld that approach, uh, which saves an enormous amount of resources, ferrying people back and forth to court all, all the time and involved in preparing and delivering testimony and the adversarial environment in which uh, hearings uh, take place. So uh, I think it's an example uh, 
uh, that suggests that sometimes we can be creative uh, about how we protect uh, people's uh, rights and we don't have to fall lockstep into uh, alignment with a, with a criminalized procedure model. Yeah, it does seem that the criminal, it's supposed to be civil, but it really looks criminal. Um, court proceeding does seem to be a bit of a kangaroo court. That's interesting to hear about New York. Would you would you speak about, um, someone has a historical question about the practice, the misuse of civil commitment of husbands civilly committing wives, basically to get rid of them. Yeah, so this was the allegation uh, of uh, Elizabeth Packard in, in uh, the 1880s and 90s when she traveled uh, the country. Um, it is not clear, as I understand the historical uh, research on this, uh, exactly to what extent that was ever true. One could understand how a sort of urban or rural myth uh, would grow up uh, around it. Uh, but um, Gerald Grob, one of the leading historians of, uh, uh, of the mental health system in the United States, looked uh, intensely into uh, Mrs. Packard's uh, case. Uh, she was um, uh, claiming at the time of her involuntary hospitalization that she was a reincarnation of the Virgin Mary, uh, which understandably would be embarrassing to a, you know, a husband who was a, a minister, but also might well have reflected uh, a degree of grandiose delusionality that could be have been associated with bipolar disorder. So, you know, was she railroaded or was she really in need of treatment? Um, not not an open and shut uh, case. Uh, so perhaps something the stuff of Hollywood. And y yes, yes, the you know. Um, uh, gaslighting uh, is a uh, is a uh, potent meme, uh, but exactly how often that sort of thing happens, uh, I think, is much less clear. Thanks. Um, would you speak of uh, some states allow for the civil commitment of alcoholics and addicts? Tell tell us a little bit. That seems to be in opposition to the recovery model, but may be necessary in some chronic case. What's your thought on that? Yeah, so um, although there are uh, a number of states that have uh, statutes that permit involuntary hospitalization uh, of people who have substance use disorders, um, there are really only two states in the country that use that law with any frequency. Mm -hmm. Those are Massachusetts and Florida. Uh, interestingly, very different states politically and, and socially, but the two leading ones in terms of uh, utilization. Uh, the, the systems are, um, so, so what, probably the first thing to say is there are no good studies that tell us how effective this approach is in terms of um, getting people on the road to recovery, which is what their ostensible purpose is. They get people off the street, they may allow them to be held in a facility and, and to detox uh, over a period of a couple of weeks to a month. Uh, but what has um, always been the, the bugaboo here is uh, what sorts of services were available after they were discharged uh, to allow them to continue on the path to recovery. And even the states that use this extensively have not built the kind of outpatient-oriented uh, treatment system that would seem to be necessary uh, for that purpose. So there may, in fact, be people whose lives would be saved by an acute uh, intervention, um, but the system is um, nowhere well enough designed to uh, allow broad scale usage on the grounds that um, this is going to be the most effective way to intervene in, in a large number of cases. Um, my friend Anne Marie from Salem, she's in charge of all things crisis in Salem, Oregon, asks the question uh, Do you see outpatient commitment as an effective alternative for persons who are not meeting the same high bar for dangerousness, but still need treatment? 
and are not engaging well. Yeah. So uh, as uh, as you noted, I I, uh, I skipped over at the end for reasons of time the discussion of outpatient commitment. So let me say a couple of things uh, now. Um, Outpatient commitment was, um, I think, uh, largely driven by what were perceived as the flaws in the uh, revised commitment laws post-1980, and in particular, the problem of revolving door patients, Uh, people who would be hospitalized involuntarily stabilize, take medications, uh, be ready to return to the community, and then very quickly stop taking their medications and relapse and come back in. Uh, And uh, people would go through that cycle many times uh, a a year in some cases. Um, And uh, outpatient commitment was proposed as the answer to the question, what can we do to break that uh, cycle? Uh, How can we uh, uh, transfer uh, to a situation of lesser constraint uh, the kinds of treatments that are available in the hospital, uh, but but apply them in the community uh, setting. Um, and the data on outpatient commitment, although they are controversial for reasons we can talk about if people uh, want to, are, to my eye, uh, generally supportive uh, of the notion that it can be uh, effective if used for a long enough period of time. So uh, the data suggests that for six months or less, it's really not very helpful if you're able to stabilize people on outpatient commitment for more than six months, uh, which usually means for a year, Uh, Well, then you see lower rates of hospitalization, lower rates of homelessness, uh, less substance use, uh, lower rates of violence, and higher rates of continuing uh, on uh, medication. Uh, So it it looks as though uh, it is a um, uh, potentially uh, helpful uh, intervention uh, for people who otherwise were falling through the cracks. Um, n- probably not for everybody because no intervention works for everybody, but it, at least for uh, a substantial number of people. The problem uh, with implementation in most places uh, has been that uh, although legislatures have been willing to pass these statutes, they haven't been willing to fund them. And the assumption has been that money would come from the existing mental health budget, which was you know, everywhere always overcommitted already, uh, and uh, that that would somehow you know, be enough. Only New York, and I'm not, I'm not speaking as a New York booster here, but, but just to be perfectly accurate, only New York appropriated several hundred million dollars to create new services specifically for people who were being placed on what in New York is called assisted outpatient treatment or AOT uh, and uh, avoided uh, just sending people out into into a void. Um, Unless we're willing to do that in other states, outpatient commitment is is just not gonna really make much difference. But it would save funding money in the long run as hospitalization would be addressed. And yeah, you, you would certainly think that, uh, that it would and, and it, it should. The other thing about outpatient commitment, which, which is, is very interesting, is that it tends to evoke strong reactions, negative reactions from civil libertarians and, and you know, many uh, patient advocates uh, because they see it as the transfer of coercion to the community. Uh, But what's interesting about that claim uh, is that outpatient commitment is not a terribly coercive uh, system anywhere uh, in this uh, country, Uh, by which I mean that although people are ordered to comply with the terms of their outpatient commitment, take medication, go to sessions, et cetera, if they fail to do so, 
no state allows them to be medicated involuntarily or to be Mm. compelled to go to sessions that they don't want to go Mm. to. The most any state uh, does is provide provisions for people to be brought in for an, an evaluation to ascertain whether they meet involuntary commitment criteria. Well, if they met involuntary commitment criteria, they could be involuntarily committed whether they're an outpatient commitment or or not. And if they don't meet those criteria, then they're simply released. So it is actually a remarkably non-coercive system, but it is one that tends to evoke very strong emotion. Oh, you mentioned New York having funding. California has just allotted an enormous, everything in California is an enormous amount of money for their new care court. Uh, are you familiar? Could you comment a little bit on what California is doing? Yeah, I I, um, I, I I was involved as a consultant early in, in that uh, process when it had a, a somewhat different uh, shape uh, to it. Uh, but it, it, um, it seems to me what they've um, constructed is a, is a system uh, that um, provides uh, a um, an alternative, frankly, to the current inadequately functioning community uh, mental health system with an alternative route uh, into it uh, to uh, allow people to uh, to receive uh, care. Uh, it started out quite different. It started out uh, conceptualized as a um, as something much more like, uh, a, uh, a an outpatient commitment uh, system, which they already they already have an outpatient commitment statute, Laura's law, uh, mm-hmm. but one that uh, carried more teeth, uh, and that evoked so much opposition that they backed down and and made these care courts into something that that is really a voluntary process. People who don't want to. Uh, participate don't have to uh, participate uh, in it. Um, I'm I'm hopeful that they will do some good evaluations so that we know whether this has really made a, a difference there uh, or or not. Uh, it does unfortunately reflect a tendency that we have to um, create new systems and layer them on top of existing systems rather than somehow fixing what's wrong. Uh, with the existing systems, but that that seems to be a, an intrinsic part of of the uh, U.S. political process. Well, speaking of politics, then um, many people believe that the mental health uh, community is involved in the civil rights movement, and some see civil commitment and hospitalization as a a form of systematic oppression, with the desire of some. Com- control these communities in the interest of maintaining structures of power. You've heard these arguments. What's your opinion here? I think what those arguments um, ignore is the reality of human suffering. Um, Mental illness is not just uh, a uh, a deviant form of self-expression as people in the 90s, some leading theorists in the 1960s uh, argued that it it was people like R.D. Lang uh, mm-hmm. or even Thomas Zoss himself, who was a psychiatrist. Um, it is a, uh, a, a disorder, an illness that uh, can cause an extreme amount of uh, suffering. It is painful to be uh, psychotic. It is acutely painful to be depressed. Uh, mania, you know, notwithstanding the accompanying euphoria, uh, is something that uh, can cause a great deal of suffering, uh, particularly as people come back down from their manic state and realize uh, how they've blown up uh, their their lives. Um, that reality, I think, tends to get lost in these politicized discussions of of social control uh, and. Um, uh, suppression of individual expression in which uh, commitment law and, and the mental health system in general are, are often framed. Um, I, as a psychiatrist, I, I can't ignore 
that individual level of uh, of suffering. And to me, when I go back historically, that always seems to me to be what uh, the civil commitment process uh, was about. Uh, the creation of facilities that were intended to be therapeutic uh, and uh, uh, of statutes that would facilitate uh, people who needed care but were unable to seek it for themselves um, being admitted to those facilities. We often did it badly. Uh, we certainly, from the Civil War on, never funded it adequately. Um, but the, the notion, it seems to me, was inherently a, a good notion that uh, we ought to uh, be there to uh, alleviate people's suffering, uh, particularly when they're not able to help themselves. Thank you. Um, continuing in politics, but maybe from the other side, a question from the defense bar here attending is how can attorneys and other advocates for people uh, who are suffering advocate for um, outpatient commitment, or in some states, outpatient commitment laws at all? So unfortunately, um, if you look at what the um, drivers have been of the adoption of outpatient commitment laws uh, in, in uh, many, many states, it's been a tragedy, a violent tragedy. Here in New York, our law is called Kendra's Law, because Kendra Webdale was pushed under the wheels of a subway train. Uh, in, in California, it's Laura's Law, named after a, a woman who was killed by uh, a, a person with uh, mental illness. Um, and, and the laws are adopted under the uh, assumption uh, that they will somehow uh, prevent violence uh, on uh, the part of people with mental illness. Um, to me, that's the wrong basis and the wrong way to, to think about these uh, statutes. Uh, violence by people with mental illness is a, a, an extremely small part of the very big problem with violence we have uh, in this country. Uh, and um, Outpatient commitment may not be the most effective way of um, uh, of uh, dealing uh, with it. Indeed, in New York, it was noted that Andrew Goldstein, the man who pushed Kendra Webdale under the, the subway car, uh, had been seeking treatment and was turned away because there were inadequate facilities to uh, to provide treatment to him. So outpatient commitment would have been irrelevant in his uh, in his uh, case. Uh, I think the argument needs to be made on humanitarian grounds, that this is an effective way to help people who are caught in this cycle of uh, continued uh, relapse and uh, recovery, but then uh, followed by another cycle after that. Uh, but um, experience suggests that it's the other argument that actually tends to carry the day. So in a sense, you've already answered this question, but I want to ask it again, because you, you are familiar with Dr. Zeke Emanuel and perhaps his thoughts on returning to a state asylum model. What do you make of that? Where does that come from? Uh, well, you know, ever since deinstitutionalization began in the 1950s, but really accelerated in the 1960s, uh, there have been people who have lamented the demise of the large state hospitals that at their peak held over half a million people uh, mm -hmm. in this country. Um, and it is, in fact, true that those facilities provided some services uh, that many people with severe mental illness lack today. It gave them a place to sleep, not on the streets. Uh, it gave them three meals a, a day. Uh, which they may not always have. Uh, it kept them out of the clutches of drugs and alcohol, uh, which are comorbid plagues uh, for, uh, for many of them. So it, it did good things, but, but at a cost, at a cost in um, 
in human terms of isolating them from from the rest of the world and and you know, labeling them as as different from uh, the the rest of us. Um, that I mean, that's the attraction uh, of it, but I think also uh, the harm of it. Uh, there are better ways, I think, to to do that. If we if we adequately funded community systems of care and other support systems, uh, the vast majority of people with even serious mental illness could be cared for in the community. Do we need more long-term beds? Yeah, in some states, I, I think we do. But but a return to the old asylums is not the answer. What do you see as the future of reform here for, for civil commitment? It, and what's the role for reformers? So at this point in time, it seems to me whatever reforms take place are likely to be incremental as they have been pretty much for the last 50 years. I don't see us uh, overthrowing in, in a, you know, a revolutionary decade like the 1970s, uh, the dangerousness-based uh, statutes. Uh, I think we can um, modify them to some extent to make them more flexible and, and more adaptable to the individual circumstances. Uh, of uh, people, we can get rid of requirements that um, may inhibit uh, their use when they're necessary. Uh, but I don't think we're going to see big changes. Now, of course, revolutions are always difficult to predict, and and um, you know something could happen tomorrow that would that would prove me wrong. But I I don't in the foreseeable future, it's hard for me to envision. Uh, massive uh, changes to our laws. I think we're going to see incremental changes. We have a lot of advocates here who, in this conference, who are people with lived experience of mental illness, and they have a great desire to be part of reform. Do you have any words for those persons? Yeah, I think they have an important role to play uh, as we think about uh, and, and we should be thinking about what, what is good about our current statutory approach and what doesn't work uh, in our current statutory approach. And how could we modify it uh, to make it work better without incurring uh, unreasonable costs in, in doing so? Um, and people who've been through the process, it seems to me, have a unique perspective that needs to be at the table. Thank you, Dr. Applebaum. This has been really wonderful, very helpful. Uh, for folks watching, uh, Dr. Applebaum has been gracious to put his email address uh, in our program if you have additional questions that he can specifically answer. Um, is that okay, doctor? That, that's fine. Um, there, there may be limits, but um, I'm, I'm happy to, to hear from people. Thank you. Thank you. We'll uh, take a short break and be back with the next session in a few moments.